Hey guys, Zach Evnesh here with the Iron Roots Podcast brought to you by Play. I'm standing inside the York Barbell Hall of Fame Museum. Look at this amazing photo. I've seen it before, but now we've got the history and we're bringing it to you here with Iron Roots, Tommy Kono, Dave Shepard, Bob Hoffman, John Grimmick, you name it. Through these next few episodes, we're gonna be taking you through an amazing ride, an amazing tour of weightlifting and iron history. Now, if you're just listening on Apple Podcasts or wherever you could listen to our podcast, make sure you tune into the Play.Pro app. That's where you could watch the videos. You're gonna see photos and see inside of the York Barbell Hall of Fame some amazing photos while I interview somebody very, very special. Get a protein shake ready, because we're gonna crush it. This is Play's Iron Roots, a podcast dedicated to uncovering the strength legends, the training methods, and the stories around physical culture and iron history. I'm your host, Zach Evanish. Grab yourself a protein shake, chalk up, and prepare to travel back in time to some of the most awe-inspiring stories of iron history. It's go time. On this episode of the Iron Roots Podcast, Zach continues his conversation with Jan Dellinger at the York Barbell Museum. Before he passed away, I was good friends with the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. And we always spoke about his training. And he said that that's what was like, that was his heavy weightlifting was always pressing guys over his head. But he said he was also very fanatical about training. Yeah. And um, you mentioning like this very hectic travel schedule, I, he mentioned like 200 plus days on the road. Yeah. He said he would play, he would um, wrestle in front of 50,000 people in Boston Arena. And he said, I didn't even have enough money to have a hotel. I'd sleep in my car and eat tuna, yeah. Yeah. tuna out of the can. That's and so I think, cool, yeah. yeah, those guys, and who knows how, how Bruno San Martino did it. He but, made money. That, that he did. Of course, if you're the champion and you're right. You, you might get but I think they go through a pretty heavy duty yeah. struggle yeah. Um, yeah. leading up to that. As the years pass and when they wrestle, uh, they always start negotiating for less days on the road. Sure. But back to back to Ken. Ken had heard he's back training. He hadn't he said I they invited him to this first world strongest man thing. He said, I started training, he said I hadn't squatted heavy in a long time. He said I worked up to six fifty. And he said I started down and he said, I feel something in my back, you know, so uh, he said, that pretty much stopped that. He said, I wasn't at my best to compete in the, in the strongman. Thing. When he competed, I think it was when like the women were sitting on yeah. the machine, right? Yeah, yeah. They had the Zuber plates. Right. Well, anyway, he, he, so what he did that day was he sat in the folding chairs like we're sitting. He pushed it up to the dumbbell rack. He would take the 90s, he'd tip them up and sit in and, and press them like 10 See, reps, put them down. Get up, he'd walk around, he's stiff, you could tell. And he did a few sets of that, and then he got Smitty to give him a rub down. You should, my God, a man of that mass, and move out. Smitty had sweat going. I, Smitty's hands were like this, he couldn't close them. He came up to punch out, and he could barely get his time card and hold it. His hands were just like that. And sweat, my God. Anyway, Ken told Third Pack, he said, he was explaining the wrestling thing to us. Right. He said, well, my back's a little bummed up. He said, I'm going to wrestle Gorilla Monsoon right before the break. I remember Gorilla Monsoon. And he said... Uh, <laughs> Such a great name. He said, basically, I'm going to... I think Turbac said, how are you going to wrestle with your back? He said, well, I'm just going to walk around the ring, taunt the fans. I'm going to roll in to stop the, count me out, and I'm going to roll out, taunt the fans. I'm going to keep that up for about eight minutes. He said, then I'm finally going to get in lock up with Monsoon, and I'll foul him once, and... Then he said, uh, we'll lock up again. I'll, I'll conk him with the ring bell, hop out, I'll get DQ'd, I'm gonna run to the locker room. He said, now, when everybody's going to the can, he said, you start toward our dressing room door. He said, I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes, and he said, I'm gonna stick my head out and have it come in. Now, you're listening to this at three in the afternoon thinking, you get paid for this? And, and he got paid pretty well. And, and, and you're thinking, well, this, we're talking about winging it. You know, this is like hours in advance. Well, darn it, that isn't exactly what happened. And when you see it unfolding, it's like, wow, there's an, there is an art to that. There's, there's an art to that, There's yeah. an art to that. Anyway, so we went, yeah, he conks Monsoon with a ring bell, and we everybody's going to the can, and 
we, we go over toward the door and he sticks his head out. We walk through the door. And I remember there's, by this time, there sits Monsoon with Baron Miguel Cicluna, looking at Cicluna's kids, a, a list of pictures like this, you know, at Bobby's wallet. And I remember him saying to Cicluna, I remember when that one was this tall. And over, over in the uh, sink area was uh, Nikolai Volkov. Yes. Who worked for Baltimore Gas and Electric for years, seeing an old man river while he was shaving. Uh -huh. And there was other guys sitting in there. I mean, I remember encountered a Samoan, I forget the man's name, who was tattooed, like fishnet tattooed from uh -huh. here all, all the way down to his ankles. Uh, we talk, Phil Redman and I went, we talked to him for a while. Uh, it, I, you know, that, that's kind of memorable. Uh, I had a friend of mine named Walt Evans who became a strength coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, in 1984. Oh, that was like their era, right? Was yeah. that their era yeah. of just dominating? They were still hanging close to the era, yeah. It was 83 or 84, I forget which. Anyway, Walt invited me out. Oh, Terry Bradshaw. He shared a room with Terry Bradshaw. Walt called me up and said, why don't you come out and spend a week? I said, where am I going to stay? The Rolling Rock beer plant? He said, no, no, you can room with me. Now, Terry Bradshaw, I said, Bradshaw rooms with you. Does. Yeah, he said, but he's going to retire. Bradshaw had an elbow operation the winter before. And I said this to Walt. I said, he's, well, he's, you've got Bradshaw. How am I going to room with you? He said, he's, he's going to retire. I said, well, that's not what I read in the paper. Darn it. I, a week went by. Terry Bradshaw announced his retirement. <laughs> I called back Walt. I said, well, can I still come out? And, yeah, yeah, you can room with me. So I spent, I, spent, I spent a week with the Pittsburgh Steelers eight at St. Vincent's College, right in the dorm, ate with them, slept with them, watched them. How were those guys training at that time? Well, what year was that? 80? 83. Okay. So this was during their uh, summer camp? Yeah, and when they're having two-a-days. Okay, were they lifting at that time? And yeah, but it was, it was uh, really heavily monitored lifting. Well, Who monitored their strength? Well, 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 okay. Well, uh, they had the running backs train in the morning. What was it? The quarterback, the running backs, and the wide receivers trained in the morning, and I think the linemen trained in the afternoon. Skill guys in the morning, big guys later. I believe. Walt would put papers down on the floor at stations, like, all right, if he wanted you to do uh, deadlifts. Right. Okay, and, and it was lighter weights for the, for the uh, smaller guys. Uh, but let's say he would have you do, and it was very good, because they were doing two a days, and it was 90s. They were carting guys off to St. Vincent's hospitals, giving them IVs. But, by the Zamboni. Now they have it right on the sideline. <laughs> he put papers down like he wanted you to deadlift. Yep. Uh, 185 for three, 225 for three, 275 for three, and that was it for that station. Oh, so he kind of, yeah. he didn't let them go nuts? No, no. The uh, only guy who did yeah. was, was Mike Webster. I was just going to ask you about Mike Webster. Mike came in after the second practice uh, he came in about five six five o'clock in the afternoon the second practice was over they practiced from three to five right in the heat of the day and they uh, they did all these one and one drills i mean it wasn't like they were you you were fighting you were hand fighting guys you know for two hours in the morning two hours in the afternoon chuck Noel was not giving anybody a break anyway so uh but he came in and uh he was one of the st stronger guys in the team as was john kolb who by that point had retired. Uh, John competed in the first World Strongest Man contest. John Cole. Kolb, K-O-L-B. Okay. Who was uh, left tackle. He's the one that protected Brad Shaw's blind side. Anyway, uh, but Webby's still playing, and he comes in, and he knew me a little, he knew I knew Kolb a little bit, and we talked a little bit, so I came in just to stretch out my hamstrings, and Walt had told me, Webster just, he thought of the king of overtraining, just the absolute king of overtraining. Well, if you come in to stretch out your hamstrings, you wouldn't necessarily squat. You wouldn't squat that heavy. Well, sure. he started at 135, and then he did 185, and 225, and 275. And quarters and plates, there, quarters and plates. Right, yeah. He got up there about 365, 375, something like right. that, for like mostly sets of 8, 10 reps. This was after the two-a-days. And in the heat... And he was, you know, he was getting to be that elder statesman right. for a football player. I had heard when he got older, he switched from like, you know, one to five reps to doing those eight to tens. Well, he, that's what I saw him do. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, he, he, still, he just overtrained it. Walt said he could, if he literally cut his routine in half, he'd still be overtrained. He probably <laughs> just more needed it like psychologically. So... You know, among other things, you know, like I said, going to uh, 
being in the re professional wrestling locker room, right. spending a week with the Pittsburgh Steelers, going to the world first World Strongest Man contest, w which was held at the uh, Great Gorge Resort, we supplied equipment. Great uh, Gorge is North Jersey, Pocono yeah. Mountains of Jersey. Yeah, Great Gorge used to be called right. Vernon Va Vernon Valley. Now it's like now it's called, it's the ski place, right? right? Well, it was a family place then. It was a Playboy Resort at the time. Uh, anyway, so like I said, went there, got to meet Kono, got to know him a little bit, uh, got to see other guys, you know, I knew Bill Kazmaier a little bit, and you got to see him again there, and um, a few other people, got to know more people, you know, that kind of, this is kind of where my, you know, Forrest Gump tour through the, the Iron Games sure. was sort of got, was in the early stages of it. Wow, amazing. A lot of history here. Yeah, I mean, I had some other things too I liked, but those those would be three of them. I bet working with Grimmick must have been amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and you know, the, he yeah, and he had to drag stuff out of me. He, he would tell you a story. He loved to reminisce. Once he got comfortable with you, and remember, it's like forty-two years difference in our ages. Right, so, right. And he was who he was. I was on his turf. Right. Uh, once he got comfortable with me, would just reminisce about Steve Reeves, George Eiferman. You know, but this guy, that guy, you know. Uh, What's a favorite story he shared with you? Do you recall? Oh, well, one of them. All right, I'll give you a Steve Reeves story. Sure. Reeves, Reeves told him that he uh, wanted, and this is the Atlantic City Boardwalk was big at the time. Uh, Reeves wanted to reverse train two big like Dobermans and walk them down the promenade there. What do you mean right? reverse train? Well, when you're hauling, whoa, what well, they're surging. Oh, right. So you like, you know, I have a Doberman, right. <laughs> so it's great. You know, you train him by say, stop, you want him to stop. Yep. No, he was gonna, the other way. I, I was gonna train him that I'm out, stop, whoa, halt, you know, they're, they're surging. Yes. They aren't surging until I'm doing okay. it. She said, my arms will look gigantic, you know, as I'm pulling these. Oh, that makes sense, that's great. People, you know. Uh, <laughs> he also told me, he said, Reeves came here I think to train for the 1947 Mr. Universe, who so was a resident of York for a while. He said, Stanko and I would take him out, we'd, you know, walk around town. And he said, we started thinking he, he might have had needed glasses. He said, whenever we went to a restaurant, he's looking at the menu and it, it was one of these, what are you guys gonna have? Right. He said, we went to an ice cream place one time, we got some ice cream. And he, you know, they, they used to have a little bit of distance. There was the counter and then they had the, the actual case that, that yep. they were in and then they had it up flares up in the wall yeah he's looking you, you see he's starting to squint and you know, so what are you guys gonna have you know there's <laughs> what did you guys have milkshakes or ice cream they, uh, Sanko's big picture Sanko liked ice cream and a lot of <laughs> <laughs> that's great thank you for supporting the iron roots podcast brought to you by play to see this episode and all the other educational resources brought to you by Play, go to play.pro, P-L-A-E dot pro. You're going to love it, and we'll see you next time.